I'm very happy to introduce uh, the next speaker, Brian Kennedy. Go ahead. You know, Martin, I think maybe you need some psychotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, I decided to follow in Matt Caberline's footsteps and not talk about what I was going to talk about. So I'm going to go through that really quickly and then talk about something new uh, just to get your feedback. And I think that I will probably be the least informed person talking about my own topic at the meeting, probably. So we'll see. So first of all, what we're doing in Singapore, just a brief update on that. Uh, we really have two programs. Uh, Healthy Longevity Translational Program and a Center for Healthy Longevity, but you can think of it as one thing with one goal to extend human health span. And so we're trying to create an entire pipeline where we can go from preclinical basic research to translational and then get into the clinic. And Andrea Meyer is a big part of this and she already gave a talk earlier. Um, on the preclinical side, we now have up and running uh, worms, flies, a little bit of yeast. Uh, killifish models, which we're pretty excited about using, stem cell models, organoids, mice, lots of mice, and bioinformatics, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today. On the human research side, we're really trying to uh, not so much create new biomarkers, although I'm going to tell you about one today, uh, but we're trying to integrate biomarkers, those that measure systemic aging versus those that measure hallmarks of aging and linked into those that measure the contribution of aging to disease. And you heard a little bit about that from uh, Martin's lab previously. So that's the big picture thing. We also have a Center for Healthy Longevity, which is very feng shui uh, and uh, not designed by me, otherwise it wouldn't have been. Uh, but it's we're really trying to bring participants in, mostly healthy participants, to measure their aging and to do interventions with them to try to see if we can slow or reverse their aging. Um, so uh, come to Singapore and see it. In fact, it, you probably can't come next week, but our conference is next week. And there, if you want to contact me or look online, you can access the conference by Zoom if you want. To. If you haven't had enough aging talks this week, there's more next week. So, And some of the same uh, uh, people are going to be coming from here to Singapore. So uh, uh, hopefully we can have a good meeting. Uh, I think a lot of what we're focused on, though, is how do we get human. And at this point, we're really in the, the stage of trying to validate uh, interventions. Uh, not treat disease. I think that's fine if that's what people want to do. Uh, but we want to see if we can really modify the rate of aging. So I'll tell you just a little bit about that. Uh, ultimately, we want to figure out what works and what people uh, and why. And so there is a personalization component, but I'm not uh, really sure that we're at that stage yet. Uh, in fact, we're just starting a study where we're going to run a mouse uh, longevity clinic uh, and bring outbred mice into our clinic, let them get to one year of age, try to measure everything about each individual mouse, and see if we can really define personalized interventions for a mouse that outcompete normal inter or uh, generalized interventions. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and then ultimately what we're doing at, in US is we want it to be scalable. So on the academic side, uh, we're taking interventions that are relatively low cost and biomarkers that we can hopefully scale the cost down so that we can uh, uh, extend it to the entire population at some point. Of course, we're happy to work with companies on all of these fronts and collaborate, and that can be other kinds of interventions as well. Um, and so the kinds of aging studies we're doing are uh, interventions in people that are relatively healthy or are healthy, middle age, looking at a wide array of old and new biomarkers. Uh, and we're trying to be relatively agnostic about interventions. So everything from micronutrients to dietary interventions, supplements, repurposed drugs, exercise, potentially new drugs if we can get there at some point. Uh, and this, I think the goal of this is to really be able to compare and contrast what works. Uh, a lot of these interventions, I think, that have been proposed in animal models are going to work in humans. Some won't, and I don't think anybody really knows yet which ones will and which ones won't. So we're, we're trying to take an agnostic approach. Using a lot of different biomarkers, you've heard about a lot of them to, during this meeting. I don't think I'm going to spend much time on this slide. Ultimately, we think it's going to be integrating biomarkers together of different kinds that's going to give us the best measures of aging. So uh, our goal is to not just collect individual data here, but figure out how these different biomarkers interact with each other. We have a number of studies going on. Um, 
And uh, we are just finishing a cross-sectional study with really deep phenotyping in three ethnicities in Singapore, Chinese, Malay, and Indian. Uh, and we'll just be analyzing that data soon. We're also collaborating with the National Precision Medicine team in Singapore where they have 10,000 genomes and we're integrating aging data with that including DNA methylation, telomere data, and a few other aging biomarkers. And I think that'll, that data should be out relatively soon hopefully and uh, I can already say that there's going to be some interesting ethnic differences in biologic aging. Uh, which will probably get me fired by the Singapore government, and uh, some as well as sex-dependent differences in aging. So um, I think we're learning a lot about aging in Singapore, which is critical. Um, and then I mentioned the human intervention studies. I'm, we're hoping for next month on the first start of AKG study. We chose AKG first because it's extreme. Well, I am biased. It's also extremely safe, and so we wanted to make sure there's no adverse outcomes. Uh, we're hoping for rapamycin or some derivative thereof for the next study to start in a few months. And the idea is to do 10 or 15 of these studies sequentially uh, so we can, as I said, compare and contrast. And we have a lot of collaborations ongoing. Um, there's a lot of drugs out there that might affect aging. Uh, the drug age database last time I looked had 110 that are reported to do something in mice. Uh, and the ones on the left are things that we work on, and I really don't want to talk about them much today. I'm going to show you just a tiny bit of AKG data because people are asking. But we have a lot of focus on alpha-ketoglutarate and on gemfibrizo, which is a fibrate. And then the other ones are things we've been testing in mice. And everything in green is something we see some beneficial effect in mice on. And so if you think of us as a validation arm in mice, we have a pretty good um, record of of taking what other people have reported in the field and seeing some kind of benefit. So I think that's a good argument that the field is on the right track. Um, things that aren't working in our hands, it doesn't mean they don't work. Uh, we're not doing it at super high power under every condition imaginable. I'm not, I don't want to argue that, but a lot of things are working, so that's the good news. I'm particularly interested in urolithin, which seems to have pretty robust effects. Um, We've changed our approach in mice, so we're not doing survival studies as much anymore, and we're doing frailty and biomarker studies in middle-aged mice. And part of the reason for that is we want to be able to link the studies as closely as possible to what we're doing in humans so we can iterate back and forth more easily. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about that, and we're happy to collaborate if you have ideas you want us to test. Uh, just a brief thing about AKG, this started as, as a product called Rejuvent, uh, and it's a collaboration with Ponce de Leon Health. Um, we showed a lot of mouse data, I'm just showing one slide. Uh, what was remarkable about our AKG studies was that it reduced frailty pretty dramatically in animals. Uh, it extended lifespan too, but the effects on frailty were much greater, so we wanted to argue that this compressed morbidity. Uh, and uh, we reported last year a human study which was not placebo controlled. It uh, contains a lot of what we will not be doing in Singapore, <laughs> which is going to be a much more controlled study. But we thought it was worth putting it out there. And uh, there were 42 participants, uh, no, uh, as I said, no controls. Uh, people took it for seven months and we did methylation testing before and after. And we saw about an eight year difference in biologic age by this test. Now, do I think placebo influences biologic age on this testing? Yes. So I would guess that something like seven or eight years is a combination of placebo effect and hopefully the intervention as well. Uh, the one thing that made me really look at this data hard, though, was that we saw uh, factors that determine the response to the rejuvenate product. And there were two of them. One is if you were chronologically old, you responded well. And the second was if your biologic age was higher than your chronologic age, you responded very well. If you already were biologically very young, you had a very small response. And I, I want to throw this out there. Uh, we need to, we're repeating this now in better studies, but I want to throw this out there to say that we need to think about which interventions are going to work in which people. And it may be that it, there is some sort of fixed maximum that you can get to biologically using the current interventions. And if that's the case, the things that are people that are aging poorly may respond to your interventions. The people that are already aging very well may have a very small response. This is only one agent. We may see something completely different with other interventions. But I think people should look at this as they're doing their studies to see if this is a trend or not. We have a, a full study uh, going, and 
Uh, it's done. We're analyzing data. And I, I, we started this before we had that other data. And we, and we decided, uh, I, I think the point here is that it's not easy to figure out how to do these aging studies. Uh, we decided in, for this study to do 45 to 65 year olds that are, have no disease. And this was done in the US by a, uh, Indiana University. Uh, and what we didn't realize, or we should have, is that if you select people in that age range that have no disease, they're biologically younger. <laughs> so they were starting out about four to four and a half years biologically younger than their chronologic age. And so we selected exactly the group that probably is not going to respond particularly well to AKG. So we do see some responses. Whether we beat placebo is still something we're trying to figure out. Um, but uh, I think that now as we go forward in Singapore, we're going to start studies with people as an inclusion criteria, not disease, but people that are biologically older than their chronologic age when they enter the study. And we'll see how that goes. Uh, there are positives and negatives to that approach. Um, all right, enough of that. Uh, you know, I talk about uh, uh, this all the time, and I think my... Uh, younger son summed that up by, he said, Brian, all your talks are health span, health span, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to talk about something different. And since we're here, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about work by uh, Max Unfried, who's the one in the hat back there. Uh, and he's a graduate student in my lab, although he spends all his time in Martin's lab, I think. Or, I don't know, do you see Martin or not? It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so he's doing some interesting work on lipids. And so this is a collaboration with Martin and Michael and also Marcus Wink in, in Singapore. Uh, and uh, this started out as how can we generate a lipid aging clock. And so I'll show you a little bit of that data. Uh, and it's become something entirely different. And I've heard somebody uh, at this meeting say that if they hear one more AI talk by people who don't know anything about AI, they're going to throw things at me. Uh, so I, I know where you are. I won't point you out, but I'm, I'm watching, just saying that. Uh, and, uh, and I probably know the least about AI of anybody talking about AI. So, but I've got all, the guy with all the answers to my, any hard question you want to answer. Uh, so the first thing we did is we worked with John Gruber, and we took some in Singapore and took a lot of worm lipid data with four different mutants, a uh, wild-type strain and three different mutants, one that has accelerated aging and reactive oxygen species elevated and two long-lived mutants, age one and eat two. Uh, and we had a limited amount of data. So we're working with very small data to try to generate a lipid clock, uh, but we're able to generate one that pretty effectively predicted the lifespan. So if you look on the right uh, in the survival curves, uh, the, the boxed plots are the actual lifespan of those strains. And the predictions are, are the linear lines that are uh, lighter. And so this clock kind of worked. We published this. It was really kind of a proof in principle to see if we could generate a clock from lipids or not. Uh, Max has gone back and generated another clock now from this uh, metabolomatinous of the mouse brain. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because uh, this is 10 different brain regions. And if you look at what the clock says, it tells you that different regions of the brain are aging at different rates. And curiously, the uh, hippocampus uh, and um, the, um, uh, I forgot the other region, Max, what is it? The, yeah, <laughs> their age, they seem to be younger than the cerebral cortex. And so uh, it, those are the two regions, two of the regions of the brain where there's neurogenesis. So I don't know if that's relevant to anything or not. This is very early data. But uh, we're now going back and trying to take other data sets with lipids and look at aging rates and other tissues, including liver and other places. So if you have lipid data that you want us to analyze and you're interested, let us know. Uh, there's also some interesting differences between uh, males and females that I won't go into today. And really, this is, this is a teaser. If you're interested, you can talk to Max. But I want to talk about something else that we thought might be more interesting. The summary from this, though, is that lipidome can be used to estimate biologic age uh, and that we can figure out which in lipids are the most influential. And that's really interesting because these lipids are very bioactive. And so if we understand what a lipid's doing, we can then hopefully work back from something that's a determinant of biologic age to actual mechanisms driving the aging process using lipids. And that's one of the reasons we got excited about it. For instance, ceramides have very strong weights in the aging clocks that we've generated so far. If you know anything about ceramides and aging, that may not be too surprising. 
Uh, we need to obviously expand this to other data sets. But the real question that we got interested in is how many lipids are actually out there? Um, and how many of them might be relevant for aging and age-related diseases? And so uh, what do we know here? Uh, Currently, most lipidomic studies, they measure a couple hundred lipids or maybe a few thousand if they're really well done. Uh, but how many lipids are there? If you look at the lipid map database, there's less than 30,000 lipids in that database. Um, and we, don't, we know what some of them do, but a lot of them are still unknown. Uh, and we think that some unknown lipids may be really good predictors of aging. So if we could have a better way of identifying and classifying lipids, we could create a whole new set of interactive molecules that might be relevant to aging and disease. Uh, and so what Max did is some clustering algorithms using machine learning to try to see if we could take those 25,000 lipids and put them into groups. And so encouragingly, uh, we got, there are eight groups of lipids. We were able to see all eight of them clustering separately. And if you look like on the polyketides, which you've probably thought about with aging before, up on the top left, you can see that they subcluster into groups as well. So the clustering algorithms seem to be working. And, and we got the idea that maybe we should do a control and take uh, lipids that are not, or take molecules that are not lipids and run them through this program as well to see whether uh, they cluster somewhere else away from the lipids, which would be what we were expecting to see. And so there's also a PubChem database, which has 111 million molecules in it. Um, and we took 250,000 of those, or Max did, and did the clustering, ran the same clustering algorithm. And so all of those molecules are in gray, and the uh, lipid clustering looks much smaller in the context of all of these other molecules, but they still segregated. Um, the inter interesting thing, though, is when you focus in on this, for instance, secosteroids here, um, you can see there are yellow dots that are known uh, lipids, but there are also some of the gray things in the pub chem are clustering with the uh, uh, secosteroids. So that may not be surprising. Not everything is perfectly classified, but we were shocked by the numbers here. So if you focus in on this, for instance, there are 300 known secosteroids, three structures there on the left. We found 30 of that 250,000 uh, that are other secosteroids that have not been uh, uh, reported in the, in the database. And if you think we're only looking at about 1 500th of that PubChem database, there's probably about 15,000 of those molecules out there that are not commonly looked at. Uh, and you can do this with the other ones as well. So what we went on to do then is to look at the um, PubChem mesh term, PubMed mesh terms, thanks to working with Morton's lab, and we can now attach mesh terms to all of these different lipids. So let me give you a little bit of an idea of what we can do. So we took convalitoxin, which is a cardiac glycoside that we more or less picked at random. Uh, and uh, you can see all the mesh terms that come out with that, the search terms, the structures on the left, and then we can find the five nearest neighbors of that structure. Uh, in, the, in the database. And again, we've only looked at 1 500th of the da real database that's out there. And you can see that some of these structures look quite interesting. Now, we don't know how these structures got put in PubChem database, and some of them may have already been tested for uh, interesting assays, but we think a lot of them probably haven't. And so it's not easy to find these molecules unless you have some kind of algorithm like this to do it. To give you another example, hill 17 alpha estradiol, which is a known longevity molecule. It affects uh, longevity in male mice, non-feminizing form of estrogen. And you can see we can find molecules that look something like that as well. A lot of the molecules that affect longevity are lipids. Uh, and so um, I think we can find a lot of new related molecules. Almost done. So in summary, you know, there's not 25,000 lipids. Everybody knew there was more than that already. But we estimate, based on the PubChem database, that there are 2 to 4 million lipids out there, which gives us a lot more interesting molecules to look at. Um, and by linking them to literature, we can then try to orient them as to ones that might be most likely to affect aging and age-related conditions. And finally, we have generative AI, too, so we can make new molecules related to your favorite molecule. And we've already played with that a little bit, and we get some really weird things that nature probably can't make and some interesting things that nature probably can make. And so I think we're hopefully building a whole new class of molecules to test for your favorite indications. 
Just briefly, we have an Asian Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, uh, which I call All About Ovaries. And uh, if anybody's interested in ovarian aging, come talk to me. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. We have a conference on the 14th and 15th. You can come to at least virtually. And we people mostly know about our webinar now. We have 62 shows online uh, interviewing uh, all kinds of people about their interest in research and aging. So you can find those on YouTube and uh, look up your favorite lectures. So uh, thanks a lot, Morton, and sorry I went a little bit over. Thanks, Brian. Really fantastic. We have a question here. Alpha KG uh, function is a cofactor for demethylases. I'm wondering whether you can dissect whether alpha KG affects methylation clocks because it affects methylation, or it affects methylation clocks because it improves biological age. Yeah, that's a good question. We saw anti-inflammatory effects and a lot of other things that suggested it was affecting aging in the animal studies. But in the human data I showed, we really just had methylation. So the studies we're going back and doing now, we have a lot of other biomarkers of aging. I will say that AKG is a really difficult molecule to try to figure out what it's doing mechanistically. It's in 700 reactions in the cell and it gets into some cell types and tissues and not others and so we've been trying to sort through that and we, I, I, I think a lot of the methylation effects are indirect but uh, some of them could be direct as well. So. Uh, thanks Brian. Uh, I have one question regarding the, you see the database of more than 30,000 uh, lipids. You mean the fatty acids because the lipids in general are a big compound, huh? Yeah, no, we, we classified everything. There's eight groups of molecules that are classified as lipids. They were listed on that slide. And so we just took everything and did, a, you know, algorithms to uh, associate them. And so we could recapitulate all those different classes. So some of them are fatty acids, some of them are steroids, polyketides, they have all different structures. Okay, and second question, sorry, uh, is there any update about the oleic acid? Because we know all in the longevity zones like in Okinawa and sardines, uh, it, there were always a consumption of high uh, of olive, uh, acid, uh, olive uh, oil and it's linked to longevity because of the oleic acid, which is the high yeah. compound inside the olive oil. We did a, a long time ago a lot of work on oleic acid and yeast looking at membrane fluidity, but we haven't looked at anything from the human data on oleic acid. It would be interesting to, to look at. All right. Thank you so Thanks. much, Brian. That was really great. Fantastic talk. Yeah. Um, <coughs>